The Teaching and Scholarship Podcast, now brought to you by the College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences, University of Glasgow. Welcome to another episode of the Teaching and Scholarship Podcast. Now, um, you may well be interested in my current uh, arrangements with uh, moving to Glasgow. I'm actually going to be moving to Glasgow in the next few days. So uh, for anybody keeping up with that exciting story, right, that's going to be happening. So hopefully the next podcast I do will be coming from Glasgow. But there may be a little bit of a gap. This may be the, the last podcast that I do for a while because I won't have my kit with me I won't have any of that I'm going up uh, with a a fairly light suitcase uh, initially and um, things uh, may take a while for me to to sort out and get around to recording some some episodes so this may be Um, the last one for a little while but don't feel too sad because we have a a really excellent guest today we have a student a medical student who goes by the name of uh, Charlie Taylor now me and Charlie have worked together quite a lot on various uh, projects in anatomy Um, he's done lots of extracurricular work with me and we have published uh, extensively in in education and um, and he is here to talk about um, kind of he's 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 been an entrepreneur and he's developed a, a company along with some colleagues not all from Southampton alongside his his medical training now medical training isn't easy and trying to do anything alongside it is, is difficult but Charlie has managed to develop a company called Cena and uh, I'll let him tell you more about what that company does but first of all let's just welcome Charlie to the podcast how you doing Charlie Oh yeah, very well, thanks. Cheers, Scott. It's a very flattering uh, introduction. Excellent. Well, it's yeah. so good to have you, and I'm really excited to have uh, an actual real guest rather than looking uh, uh, across the screen. So we can actually do that now, which is fantastic. Um, you know, we've we know each other well. We you know we've we've done lots of work together. And and when you first told me about Cena, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, I suppose it was a while before. I really cottoned on to the idea that this was quite a big deal because, mm. you know, people do start up things. Like people, lots of people have good ideas. They, they think of something new and original that they can do and particularly something that's enterprising, that's something that can not only benefit others but also is, is a, you know, is, is a business that, that can create revenue and can actually, you know, be successful in, in, in that sense, in an economic sense. Um, and... I've always been impressed by your work ethic because you've always managed to squeeze in all the work we do on top of medicine, right? Medicine's tricky. Yeah. You know, the, you compare the, the average medical timetable to most other degrees. I mean, you're pretty busy, right? Yeah. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about, first of all, your, your sort of, uh, your, your background about getting into medicine, wanting to be a doctor, and then how your experience at Southampton um, led to this this development of Cena? Yeah, so I think um, I'm probably not the most traditional um, route into medicine in the sense that I think a lot of people, you know, they wanted to be a doctor since, you know, since they could walk. And for me, that certainly wasn't the case. I think I was a pretty poorly behaved child in secondary school. Um, But then it came to sixth form and I sort of ended up knuckling down. And And I got to the end of sixth form and I was like, I'm kind of good at science. I'm rubbish at art, rubbish at everything else. So what's sort of sciencey and and quite hard and challenging? And also, as cliche as it is, you know, what lets me work with people? So that's sort of how I found my route into medicine. And then um, Southampton was, uh, well, fortunately, the only place that would take me. But, you know, thankfully it was. I I wouldn't change it um, now. So that I got to Southampton and I just, you know, found an amazing group of friends who are, who are, who I still live with, um, now, you know, what, five years later. Um, and I really enjoyed medicine and sort of the different, 
perspective a lot of the studying gives you because i mean at the end of the day you're, you're sort of studying people right and the way people go right and the way people go wrong so um i found that really fascinating and then this this idea this scene sort of came off the back of what i was experiencing on placement but also what my co-founders were experiencing in their very different non-medical walk of lives yeah now i didn't know that apparently you weren't particularly well behaved in your <laughs> early days because i've 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 only ever known you as a very responsible considerate upstanding member of, t- of society i mean is this just a front that you put on yeah you're, you've clearly never spoken to my parents because they were <laughs> something very different <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's interesting i mean and and do you know what i'm i'm also very tired of this whole i've wanted to, i've wanted to be a doctor since the day i was exist. born i mean it's like really does that and, and also if even if that's true does that make you more committed and more worthy of being a doctor? Like, exactly. I, I, I mean, and, and because it just seems like that's the most dedicated thing you can say. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, it. I, I guess in the days when people first said that, people probably were impressed by it. But I just think it becomes a bit too, too cliche now that people don't want to hear it either. But yeah, I mean... It's, you know, and it's not the first time I've heard people say Southampton were the only place that they'd be in. <laughs> and, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way either, because I think Southampton offers a brilliant experience. And, and, um, and, and I think in some ways, you know, it's unique in the way that it really um, listens to students and, and, and gives them um, opportunities to flourish. Uh, yeah. W- not just in the curriculum, you know, but beyond and, and do other things. And yeah, I mean, that's interesting. And, uh, I mean, you, you've got these friends that were um, that you you've still got now that you've mm. you've made throughout university. So, but the, these these are the people that you know you you got the idea for forming a company with came from. Is that right? S- sort of to an extent, but but and sort of before I sort of allude to that, I think one thing I want to pick up on that you said there as well is I did a quick placement uh, before med school. You know, you're trying to build your CV and get into med school. Yeah. Um, with a doctor that used to go to Southampton, a GP that used to go to Southampton, and she said I would recommend Southampton because you'll meet real people there and nice people and I think that's actually quite important within medicine because medical students in the medical cohort are quite an interesting bunch of individuals they sure are <laughs> they can be uh, very eccentric or very hard working um, and what I experienced in Southampton is that the majority obviously not all but the majority are really nice people but as you said so the, the idea for Cena actually came from it was really odd actually it was, I was approached by someone who I'd never met before um, who is now Johan, our CEO and um, co-founder. Um, and the idea was born in COVID. So for the first two years of working, I'd never met many of my co-founders in person before, um, which you know is a big testament to teams and zoom because we managed to start a company over these remote video software um you know uh, platforms but um yeah I, I thought it was just amazing and it, it's quite an interesting story how we how we came together and johan tells it far better than me and with much more passion than me um but yeah it's it, it's great and w- really what happened was johan was is was an employee at ibm at the time and he was annoying a old preschool friend of mine, actually, uh, Joe, who was also working at IBM, who is our uh, our lead designer, um, basically saying, constantly injuring himself in the gym and at work um, and annoying Joe, saying, you know, complaining about his injuries. And then Joe said, well, I've got a, you know, a, a medical friend um, studying medicine. Let's ask if this is a common problem. And I, he came to me and, he, and I, at the time I was on sort of an orthopedic rotation. And um, I said, yeah, I mean, everyone's always getting injured and physiotherapy in the nhs sucks so let's see what we can do about it brilliant so you just uh, you know uh, is it like one of my ideas where you have this great idea down the pub after six pints and then everyone's going yeah and toasting their glass going this is what we're going to do and then tomorrow you wake up with a hangover and go oh no what how do we do this uh was that actually yeah yeah i don't you know i mean because when did you really get a sense that um that it was really going to take off so yeah so and you said when i came to you so you know i came to you and it took you a while to sort of you know 
maybe uh, sort of have a listen out to what I was doing. I think that's probably because we came to people quite late. I'm very much of the mindset, don't tell people you're climbing a mountain until you're at the top. So we kept the idea under wraps for a long time when we were just trying to see, is this going to work? Is this feasible? Um, and what we really, the first thing we did was identify who do we need in a team to make this idea a reality. And the most enjoyable part of Cena is the fact that we've got people from medical design, business, engineering, coding, all these different backgrounds coming together. And without one of us, it wouldn't work. Yeah. And you've, you've mentioned just the dynamics and of the different members and what they bring to the team. So you mentioned Johan. Did you mention the others? Yes. Yeah, so, so let's go through them again, because we're, after, you know, tell us a little little bit about each member. And then um, we've we've actually got a we're going to cut away to a pre-recorded um, segment, which we will hear from some of uh, Charlie's colleagues. And they'll say a little bit more about Cena and what what they do. Um, but I think it would be just quite nice to hear from you in the first instance just to kind of introduce them a little bit absolutely so i'll start with sort of the core uh, co-founders and at the at the top if you like it always seems weird to say at the top because at the end we are just i mean he is he is sort of our ceo but we are just a group of friends with a a silly idea that so far is is you know doing okay but um at the top is uh johan um our ceo and he is how i would describe the drumbeat of cena he's the thing that keeps us all going and in my opinion sort of the most valuable player because when I can't be asked in the evenings to come back from placement do a bit of revision and then work on Cena he's the one cracking the whip in a friendly sort of way and but he he doesn't sort of say you got to do task x he motivates me to think oh I'd love to do task x to see see what comes with it so he's the the business sort of consultant aspect of it and it's it, yeah his role is amazing and then on the other side, we have uh, Joe Galliford, who's our design um, our design lead. He's a, a design graduate from Loughborough University, and I'm exceptionally jealous of the work he does. It's something I've realised that medicine is actually incredibly boring. I'm sitting here going, yes, symptom, you know, an ouchy shoulder means you might have this. And he's sort of understanding the user experience and make, making these amazing animations. I always send him sort of content and I say, you know, can you wave your wand over this? And I sent him, you know, not very aesthetic or interesting um, a poster, let's say, and he brings it back and it is just fabulous. But he really gets into the user psychology of what we're doing. And I'm very, I wish I was a designer, basically. <laughs> um, and then also the other co-founder other than myself is uh, Rob Andrews, who's a Southampton student. Oh, you know, I'm going to butcher his um, course now, but I believe he's a uh, software or computer engineer, something very technically. Um, he writes in numbers and letters and then actually makes amazing software, which is so above my head. He basically, he, he's responsible along with a wider team. I must mention as well, Pranay, um, who we have sort of on a consultancy basis. Uh, Pranay Katecho is also a Southampton graduate. Together, they've coded um, and built Cena, which again, the idea is sort of alien to me. The fact that you can type in code to a computer and then have a piece of software which is working and diagnosing and treating people. Um, so yeah, he, he's he's sort of the the wizard of it all. Hey everyone, my name is Johan. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Cena. I wanted to talk briefly about the foundation of Cena and putting the team together during lockdown. So Cena started from a shoulder injury that I'd had for about three years, uh, coupled with a knee injury, and um, I was I was going to physio. I was spending a lot of money, and I was I was constantly moaning um, to one of the co-founders, Joe. Um, and we were doing an internship together at a tech consulting firm and I was just consistently just mithering him in the air, honestly. And and we ended up just discussing the idea, okay, could you deliver something like this through someone's phone? So we did like this almost like Ocean's Eleven style thing where we wrote down, who do we need? Okay, we need someone from with a medical background, someone with a physio background, someone with a um, development background, design background, business, etc. 
and then we just went out there and this is like when lockdown is first happening and and, and we use different strategies to attract everyone uh, and, and we eventually built this really core team but one thing that we did from the offset was we had a really strong vision we we knew exactly what we wanted to deliver and we knew how we wanted to deliver it and and when we were bringing people in whoever we interviewed whoever we spoke to the the most important thing was okay obviously you need to be able to do the job at hand but coupled with that we were looking for people who cared about the solution who saw the real need for it and were passionate about it and i think that's one of the core reasons why we have a really strong culture in cena and and we'd never met each other previously and we were we'd only known each other probably for about 6 months of working on the project at the beginning only online and and it was that that vision that important vision that we constantly drilled uh, into each other like again and again we were just saying this is the vision this is what we're trying to do and then coupling that with the the drum beat which i think is one of the most essential things for a startup right is can you get the rhythm of the drum beat right and i i think we we did a really good job of that excitement that you get in a startup that excitement of problems are fun to have right because you're essentially you're writing down a list of problems that you have uh, and and a startup is a, is a, is essentially a problem solver and a product builder um but you've got nothing no tools and no manpower to do it and you you've got to figure out okay it's zero resources um other than you know you, you, the sweat on your back how are you going to do what you need to do and and we use that as as the drumbeat and and that really drove like a really cool culture between the team and and I'm, i think all the team are really proud of that is is the culture that we've developed and when we eventually uh, I met up with each other and we had the opportunity after the lockdowns to to you know uh, introduce ourselves in person we we had such a fun time and we're really good friends and we we still really passionately uh, believe in the project uh, and I think that's that's what um is is one of the most important things um within Cena internally that drives the the team forward and and has driven us to the point that we're at of course we've we've got the biggest hurdles to go and we're we're nowhere along the trajectory in reality um but i think one thing that we can be proud of is the little that we've got so far and the, as far as we've come um we've done it with we're building a really nice team and and a great culture at that and 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 that's really important hi my name is joe and i'm a co-founder and the head of design here at Cena medical technology just as a little background about myself, I studied user-centered design at Loughborough University, during which I took a placement year out at IBM, and it was in this year that I was fortunate enough to meet Johan, and the whole ideation behind Cena came about. Since then, it has been a fascinating experience to say the least, um, a steep learning curve for sure. Um, I think before beginning with Cena, I had a very limited understanding of the medical world in general. I think um, I think GCSE bio biology is about as far as I got on that topic. And so as you might expect, it did not take much to feel completely alienated when sitting in a call with physios talking about patella tendiopathy or acute shoulder tendinitis, um, with me all the while frantically Googling each word to keep up with what they were saying. Uh, but since then, it's been brilliant, and we, uh, and I, have learned more than I ever thought I would about the physiotherapy world. Um, and this is not just sort of how it works and, and the steps behind it, but the dynamics behind it, and what good and what bad physiotherapy looks like, and what is effective and what is frustrating. Um, and as a result, I am really proud of what we as a team have been able to create through applying this knowledge. As my role as head of design, my two main responsibilities are one, to create a vision, not just for the design team, but for the company as a whole. Um, and two, to ensure the service we are providing is as user friendly as possible. Quite often when people think of design, they think of making things look pretty. And whilst yes, we, we do try and do this, the truth is most of our time is dedicated to understanding every little detail of the user, of the person interacting with the service themselves in a bid to make each aspect of the service as easy and as enjoyable to use as possible. 
as you can imagine, physiotherapy is not an easy thing to recreate in a digital space. And so we have d dedicated our time over the past two years speaking to physios, speaking to patients, inspecting every little detail of the current physiotherapy journey and testing each element we come up with um, of our digitalized journey over and over again to ensure what we create is not only as simple as visiting the physio in person, but fundamentally as accurate as visiting the physio in person. Hi guys, I'm Chris. I'm one of the co-founders and physiotherapists who has helped build and design senior medical technology. So just a little bit about me. I graduated from Manchester Metropolitan University in 2020 with a BSc on in physiotherapy. In my third and final year, this is where I got introduced to Johan, who's our chief executive officer. And from then we began to work on this product. Whilst doing this, I've also been working as a rotational band fire physiotherapist for the past year and a half, working in a wide range of departments such as intensive care, stroke, paediatrics, medicals and musculoskeletal outpatients. I have recently started my role as a senior musculoskeletal and lifestyles physiotherapist, where I've specialised in the, in the diagnosis, management and treatment of MSK conditions with a particular interest in um, obesity and how we can treat the lifestyle factors that are related to this condition. My work also branches out within the private sector where I primarily treat those unfortunate enough to be involved in major trauma and um, mainly in events such as road traffic collisions. So if you couldn't tell already, um, my main interests are musculoskeletal physiotherapy, but more pertinent to Cena, I have a massive, massive interest in medical te technology and how it can act positively to bring a better standard of care to all and close the gap in health inequalities, not only just in the UK, but especially in places such as third world countries where healthcare pretty much doesn't exist. The thing that sparked my interest in medtech was even before Cena started, I remember in one of my university modules where we were asked to critically analyse an interesting topic that was relevant to today's practice, so I chose health inequalities. I remember hearing a statistic which caught my attention, it stuck with me since, and that's males who live in deprived areas um, were likely to live 10 years less than those living in affluent areas. And some of the key components related to this are financial income, education, location, access to the services that are provided, and employment status. So this got me thinking, regardless to any of the things I've just mentioned, a large proportion of deprived adults are likely to have access to technology, either through their phone or laptop. Therefore, within the context of physiotherapy, what if we could bring a service in a timely, low-cost manner that delivers first-class diagnosis, treatment and management of their MSK complaints? And this is where it all began for me. And I don't know if it was pure accident, but a week later, Johan got in contact um, to see if any third-year students at MMU wanted to get involved um, in a physiotherapy startup. And essentially, this is where my senior journey all began. So my main responsibilities um, within Cena are to work alongside Tom, who's also the other physio who I actually went to MMU with. Um, and the first thing that we needed to do was kind of note down the, the conditions and pathologies for each joint. Once these were chosen, we needed to look on how we could start to begin to diagnose these conditions. Um, and this was done using symptom selection as a pathway to build algorithms. Myself and Tom have a heavy research bias and it's something that we really, really enjoy and which may be sad to some people, but trawling through the literature um, to find a strong evidence base to implement into the algorithms, which, which is something we really enjoyed. We then relied on the trial data, which we've recently collected, um, to compare the accuracy of the algorithm to our diagnosis in which has now begun to build an accurate system in diagnosing a pathology. And following the diagnosis, we then offer a recovery plan. And therefore, another responsibility of myself and Tom was to build an extensive catalogue of exercises. And to any physios or those who work in healthcare would understand that this took an extremely long time to build. <laughs> 
these exercises were then added um, into phases um, and to progressively overload the patient um, in, in a safe manner. Initially, um, in the early stages of Sina's development, Johan already had a clear vision of what he wanted the product to finally turn out like. I'd like to say that that vision of, of what he wanted is still very much firmly embedded and it's something that we're always driving towards. However, one thing I did not expect was the amount of hurdles that come up when, when setting a startup. Um, and coming from a physiotherapy background, I had no idea about the complexities of building a product like Sina and the time it takes to build. Um, I think one evening we had an hour call <laughs> on the right shade of blue that we should use um, for Sina, which, by the way, is a beautiful colour. Um, and I think the other one was the correct shape of the S, um, which, to much of my amusement, we laugh about now. Anyway, here we are, two and a half years later with a minimal, minimal viable product, and two and a half years has absolutely flown by. Um, I think one of the main challenges when building Cena um, was COVID. I think his COVID pretty much struck as we started to get the ball rolling. Um, and on so many occasions, it would have been easy to jump in the car, have a group, and have a group meeting face to face, opposed to being Microsoft Teams. You know, tasks such as recording the exercise videos could not happen for about a year and a half, which put a real halt to proceedings. Um, I think the other challenges for Cena as a team were taking individuals from all different backgrounds and starting to build some level of cohesion between us, which I think we did really well. Um, I think the skill to be extremely flexible and think outside the box is essential in, in every startup. So an example of this, um, I had one idea about how I think the product should be and the, uh, the people who code, the UX, UI guys come back and said that physically can't happen, Chris. So learn to be flexible in that manner and come up with new solutions is something which is really, really important. I feel that as a team we are resilient, determined and committed to achieving the goals of the vision that was set out right at the very start. Um, and I think that throughout every single thing that we do, we demonstrate an extreme high level of professionalism and passion to ensure that in the long term this product makes a positive difference to people's lives. So, in my opinion, Cena's not even started to show its potential. I truly believe that it has the ability to bring such different to people such difference to people globally and give them an opportunity to access high quality of care in a timely, cost effective manner which I believe is a basic human right. I would like to see Cena working abroad with these countries that are less um, fortunate as things like the UK and expanding its content into the realms way beyond musculoskeletal physiotherapy to help people with a wide range of medical conditions. So thank you um, for listening to the short clip and hopefully I'll meet you all soon. Um, okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Rob. I am the tech lead at Cena and also a master's student studying towards an electronic engineering degree at the University of Southampton. Uh, I joined Cena last year. Uh, the guys put an ad to uh, many universities across the UK and I uh, responded and ended up joining the team uh, at the end of the summer last year. Uh, my work at Cena entails uh, doing the day-to-day -day developments of the application, talking to Charlie, uh, Charlie about like sort of the medical um, details and what would need to be in the algorithm, what would need to be incorporated in the algorithm, and also uh, Joe as the, uh, the chief design guy. And we, so I worked alongside Pranay. Um, we were both developers and at the time when I joined, I didn't have that much experience, but it's kind of, uh, it was great fun learning on the job, um, just kind of seeing what we could build, expanding our skills. Uh, it was quite a challenge alongside uh, my degree. However, I think if there's something that you enjoy doing, 
you can you can kind of make time for it, make every hour in the day count. I mean, I think you can clearly see there that it's just this whole group of people who bring a unique skill and talent to the table to make to make it work. So, so tell us some. Um, we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty of mm. kind of you know how it maybe how effective it's been because i know that you've attracted some funding and we'll, we'll talk about some of that stuff but tell us some because we haven't really got into the meat of what it is what and it what is. it does yeah. um and um how what the gap is why what does it do um that wasn't there already yeah absolutely and i'm gonna i'll have to be careful here not to go into sort oh of yeah intellectual right okay <laughs> no, oh, oh, right. Just you, sort of, you know when you've you given a spiel so many times that it comes off like a script um but basically so we're seeing a medical technology that's the name of our company and what i think it's best to first define the problem and then the gap and the solution what we realize is that people get injured all the time so musculoskeletal those being you know injuries to the musculature or the skeletal system of the body happen to everyone and i'm talking about sort of from rheumatoid arthritis all the way to low back pain and neck pain when you're sitting at your desk and then on the other end of your spectrum you've got dislocations you know uh, vertebral fractures um, these account for 30 percent of all gp visits across the uk they're the third largest area of nhs spending but very rarely are they life-threatening and because of their non-fatal sort of uh, manner, quite often they're trivialised. So if you're a top performing athlete, you have a private physiotherapist, you have access to top healthcare because it's within your institution and whatever you may be doing. However, people such as myself, you know, we're not top performing athletes. We are people who are always injured and active. We sustain these injuries on average, you know, once every two, three months. And we grin and bear them. And if we don't grin and bear them, we go to the NHS where the average waiting time is about, you know, well, the average waiting time is eight months. But after COVID, it's come up to, you know, three years for a knee replacement or um, four weeks to see, even to see a secondary care referral. Or you can go private where the average physiotherapy program costs about £400. So we saw a gap where people were sustaining injuries, having their quality of life you know, diminished with their pain and their symptoms and not managing to access treatment. And this came at a time during COVID and we thought, surely along with this telehealth, you know, telediagnostic revolution that we're witnessing, you know, all GP consultations and such are moving online, we must be able to build a solution. And as you said, there are sort of I guess, um, competitors out there. I, don't, I, I hesitate calling them competitors because it's sort of an indirect competition. There are sort of chronic pain management tools. There are online rehabilitation and exercise programs. But what we are, and, and the sort of phrase we use to sort of drum up a bit of excitement is we are an end-to-end -end diagnostic management and rehabilitation service. And what I mean by that is you can have an injury, you can use our software, receive a medically accurate diagnosis, a management plan, a severity assessment, and you know, therefore be triaged to the appropriate services, or be rehabilitated and treated in-house in an app with no clinician dependent barriers, access costs, or waiting times. So we're really trying to make musculoskeletal healthcare universally accessible and equitable. Okay, so if I've got this right, you can you injure yourself mm. and with all the stuff you just said, you know, the inconvenience of the long waiting times and, and all this stuff. And also you might just grin and bear it because like you say, it's trivialized. You you can actually use this app f to, to kind of manage and kind of do the right type of activity and and, and try and repair yourself by making good decisions is that yeah absolutely it? so for example let's say let's say you you know you've torn your your anterior cruciate ligament your, your acl if you put in your symptoms into our service we'll give you and you will be able to achieve an accurate diagnosis we'll be able to tell you okay without you necessarily yeah. needing to log up the nhs's uh you know waiting times a gp appointment and then based on that give you the rehabilitation program that will rehabilitate your acl term okay so it's it's about a diagnosis but it's, i mean what if you need you, you know you're in a lot of pain you need to be prescribed painkillers what what then absolutely and that's where we set our threshold so our, our thresholds for referral 
are red and yellow flag thresholds where, for example, do you have low back pain or are you indicating something more serious? Is this something neurological? Is it, could this be yeah. cord or quinus syndrome or something? So we've built into our software. So along with myself and the medical team, I work with uh, Chris and Tom, two qualified physiotherapists, and we're supported by a big clinical board of advisors, which help us to build these algorithms um, and build these sort of um, decision trees, which will enable to determine those that need to be referred and those that can be appropriately managed from the comfort of their home. I mean, this is incredib- incredibly technical. And I mean, given the fact that all of you guys have got busy lives doing other stuff, right? Mm. I mean, to sit down and do... It's one thing sitting down having an idea and then it's another thing doing all the market research and actually looking at it very, very carefully uh, to see whether this actually really has legs and then and then committing to it. I mean, um, how, how did you... How did you sort of begin taking on that? Because that's huge. Yeah, so I, I remember when I was um, basically being interviewed by Johan and, and Joe, um, our CEO and our, our lead designer. Um, I was on, t- Joe reached out to me, said, we've got this idea. Do you mind if we just run it past you? And um, I was actually in a club with him, uh, with Joe uh, in London a few months before. And, we're, you know, we're dancing away in a club and, and Joe turns to me and he says, do you do anything about musculoskeletal health care? Well, that's a weird question for one in the morning, you know, in, in a club. And then I put two and two together when he said that he had this idea and I thought, oh, you're running, you're sort of, I, I worked out that they've had this idea. He was gauging if I had any knowledge and now he's sort of seeing if I'd be interested. So I sort of realized I was being interviewed without being told I was sort of being interviewed. Um, and they ran the, the idea past me and I loved it. And then a few days later they said, the idea we ran past you, would you be interested in being involved? And I thought, absolutely. I, I, I saw the potential. I, I absolutely agree that there's a gap in the market and I have a real issue saying no to work. <laughs> if someone that tells you to do something, I, I'll, I'll, uh, if I'm excited and I'm passionate about it, I'll do it. But the, as you've said, the sitting down and the nailing it is, you know, I think scene has been built between the hours of seven in the evening and, and one in the morning, because that's when we're all either not at work, not studying. And that's when we put in the hours to, to this. Yeah. I mean, one thing I do know about you is that, you know, you're very tenacious. So if I sort of say, let's write a paper on this, you will write the paper, you will see it through, you'll, you'll, you know, you, you won't give up on stuff. And, and, but it must have been hard to know, hang on, are the rest of these guys like that as well? Because otherwise I don't want to be wasting my time. Um, I'll let you answer that in a sec. But mm. um, the the other thing was, the I, okay, it's hard to believe, isn't it, that somebody would say something like, do you do much in musculoskeletal health or, you know, pathologies or whatever, at two o'clock <laughs> in the morning in a yeah. club? I mean, it, to be honest, it's like when I was going to clubs a long time ago, I'd be like... You know, where can I throw up? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be, that's the last thing that would ever come yeah. out of my mouth. And then the idea after that, that he and you remembered it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. So, oh, do you remember that thing I said to you at two o'clock in the morning in that club? You know, yeah. um, you know, after 12 pints. Do you, do you want to do that? It's <laughs> like, I mean, it's, I mean, what? But, you know, yeah. I don't know it's just like a different world I mean I yeah I, I think that's I, genuinely I think in the informal environments so not necessarily in a pub um, alcohol doesn't have to be involved obviously but um, outside of the, the workplace I think that's where some of the best ideas come from so I, I mentioned that we were online for we, we worked and sort of worked together for the first two years almost maybe just like less than two years uh, online and we came together at my house uh, for the first time for like a big team meet up and it was more of a social get together and a, a celebration of a few milestones we'd reached as well as a bit of a, a, a few, two days workshop and absolutely out of those two days we did more work than we'd done in the previous two months and it was because it was an informal setting it's because we were we were chatting we were just you know blue sky thinking to use the cliche and the ideas that were coming out were fantastic and I mean, we're, we're hoping to launch the product in a, in a few weeks and the majority of the features that you'll see within the product and within the service came out of those discussions. And it is the the definition of sort of multidisciplinary, you know, cross-faculty work because you've got a, physio, a qualified physiotherapist talking to a graduated designer, talking to my mum who's got an knee injury. And you've got the patient, the designer and everyone all in one space and that is how you're going to build a service which reflects your end user yeah and i mean it's everyone kind of brings their 
their own skill to the table as we've already said but who i mean you're not you know you're studying medicine people are good at software they're good at other things um you know you don't necessarily or you're not expected to have sort of that that business acumen, you know, mm. to, to to quote the apprentice, where you're expected to know what a good business decision is, and you know the conflicts of what you're interested in, i.e., medicine, and you know to some degree, you know the human body and what can go wrong with it, um, from a musculoskeletal perspective. But you know, um, you know that it takes a lot of extra effort to teach yourself about business from scratch you know and I know from social media and from other things that you've done that you've really put yourselves out there you know you've gone out for funding you've tried to um, promote and raise your profile um, to try and test out the the features um, in advance to, to create lots of media attention around certainly locally at least mm. and I know and I, and, and, and I guess that's one question but also another question is how much has the university kind of supported that type of activity have they um you know have, how have they responded to um this venture yeah so um some really interesting points there and i think i'm going to start that by sort of talking briefly about i cannot encourage people enough to do things which aren't necessarily on their path so I think I think medicine is a wonderful, wonderful degree and in, in vocation and, and something to pursue. But it tends to be that people start their first day of medicine as a, a first year medical student and then they are forever the medic. You know, as soon as you go home for Christmas, your granny's asking you, how's medicine? You are a medical student and that is all your personality. 